Boreda, Croesa, Booth Ed Dew, Undregarog, Urthrem, and Bendithio, Booth Ed Heluich, Uineb Arnom. Good morning. Welcome. You'll have to stop cl clapping eventually, you know, because I'm going to keep doing it, so. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us as we gather to worship him this morning. A particular welcome to anyone who is new or who is visiting us this morning, and also a special welcome to those of us who are watching online, uh, particularly those who'd like to be here but are not well enough or otherwise unable to to be here. Uh, we love you. We're praying for you. Today is Palm Sunday. Uh, this week is Holy Week. So there are a few changes to our schedule. Uh, so do check, I'm not going to list them, but do check whether that group uh, or event that you're planning to attend is actually still happening this week, because I think most of them are not. Um, but on Friday morning here at 11 a.m., our regular time, uh, we have a Good Friday service. Uh, that'll be a contemplative service where we uh, can reflect on the cross and uh, we'll have the Lord's Supper uh, together. And then on Sunday, Easter Day, uh, we have a baptismal service. I think we've got something like seven people who are going to be baptized that day. And there'll be an evangelistic message. So it's a good opportunity for you to uh, bring along those who you've been uh, sharing your faith with if you think that's appropriate. Uh, then the Sunday after Easter... Uh, April the 7th, that is, at 6 p.m., uh, New Life Church, we're going to have the first of our uh, Pray for Cardigan prayer meetings. So once a month, the first Sunday of each month in the evening, we're going to uh, gather folks from all the churches in the Cardigan area, and we're going to spend an hour together in prayer uh, for the town of Cardigan, for God's blessing uh, on this town and this area. Um, so please do try and make that. That will be uh, 6 p.m. April the 7th at New Life Church. And then the following month, it, it will be uh, our turn to host here. If you're still on track with the church Bible reading plan, and it's absolutely fine if you're not. I know sometimes that other things get in the way. But if you are still on track, then last week you'll have finished reading the letter to the Hebrews. And you will have read some words which I think uh, would make a really good call to worship for us this morning. So I'm just going to read some words from Hebrew and then, Hebrews and then hand over uh, to Steve. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, from verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. <laughs>
benedicion di cid cid hathio as we have having prayers today um, we will have also at the end of this service further prayers for those who wish to have them in the far corner um, there will be a small group who will come and pray with you at the end of the service if you wish almighty and everlasting god you so loved humanity that you sent your only son to take on himself all our sins becoming an atoning sacrifice even for us that we might be welcomed into your presence washed clean and blameless and so that in your mercy we who believe in you may participate in your resurrection if we hold on to the confidence in faith we first had in you your son went ahead of us so that we have an eternal model of sacrificial love for us to aspire to and to demonstrate in our own lives to our families our friends our neighbors this holy week and throughout whatever length of years you grant us in your justice and mercy creating us a kalon lan a pure heart that we may become your true servants and friends in Jesus name we pray amen we pray for our king charles and for the princess of wales and for all others who are diagnosed with or are undergoing treatment for cancer or are in recovery from that cursed disease strengthen all who are dealing with cancer whether physically or mentally and also be with all who have care for those who are in that situation we pray for all others known to us who are unwell in body or mind or in straitened circumstances who live in fear or in poverty or are seeking work or are otherwise troubled in these troubling times we pray for good government and the return of common sense into public life grant the gifts of wisdom and understanding to all who would seek public office in this election year and may all who are in office purely endeavor to work for us all without fear or favor help us lord to continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving and may your blessings continue to rest on us on our families and our friends and to be at peace with our neighbors wherever they are and wherever we go so lord for us all now may we or may the peace of god himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ he who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it amen Uh, if you're able to stand now, if you don't, rather stay sit, seated, um, seated for this time, that's great. But if you can stand now, and even at home, I just want you to um, maybe just stand with me now. Maybe just close your eyes. Just close your eyes. And try and take yourself to that first Palm Sunday. That time when... There were crowds gathering at the entrance of Jerusalem. Maybe there were people standing outside looking out across the dry land, waiting in expectation, in anticipation that the Messiah was coming. And yes, some would have been expecting 
a very different Messiah than what we know. But they knew that the Messiah was coming. They knew that this Jesus, who had performed great miracles, was on his way into Jerusalem. And people had their palm leaves ready to lay down as he came in on that donkey. And they were excited. Imagine the excitement. Imagine the feeling inside. They were just waiting. They see him come in. And their hearts were gladdened. And they raised their voices.
sacrifice thank you that you came down to this earth for us and thank you that you give us so much lord thank you for the gifts you've given this morning for this this offering that we've re- you've received this morning lord and we pray lord your blessing on that wherever it's used wherever it goes lord we pray that you would bless it immensely and that through it people would turn to you and know you and know your love in jesus name amen Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is this thing working? Great, great. I'll start with a prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord our God. And may your Holy Spirit be powerfully at work within each of our hearts this morning, no matter where we might be in our relationship with you. Amen. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. And we've got verses 1 to 11 here. So the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, don't worry, it's up on the screen as well. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. 
When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked round at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, a little boy was sick on Palm Sunday and stayed at home from church with his mother. And his father returned home from church holding a palm cross, because it was an Anglican church. The little boy was curious and asked, why do you have that palm cross, Daddy? Well, you see, son, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches as a sign to honor him. So we got crosses made of palm today. The little boy replied, oh, shucks. The one Sunday I miss is the Sunday that Jesus actually shows up. (laughs) Well, we are a people who look for signs to tell us the times. We mark our lives with signs. We mark events, relationships, and achievements, like birthdays with cards and presents, relationships with wedding rings and status updates on Facebook, certificates or trophies for certain achievements. We mark our lives with signs. We also mark the seasons with signs. Imagine you fell into a coma, a deep, deep sleep. Well, hopefully not in the next 20 minutes. But imagine if you then woke up after some time and there was a stocking at the end of the bed. You would know it was probably Christmas. Or if you slept again for a long time, you woke up and there was a chocolate egg at the end of a bed with a four-year-old child uh, covered in chocolate eating it. Well, you'd know it was probably Easter. If you woke up and there were daffodils everywhere, you might guess it was St. David's Day. If you woke up and everyone was wearing green and drinking Guinness, it's probably St. Patrick's Day. But what if, having been asleep for a long time, you woke up and at the end of the bed was a green stocking filled with daffodils and Easter eggs and Guinness? Well, you wouldn't know what the times were. The signs would be all jumbled together. And in a nutshell, That's something that Jesus is doing on Palm Sunday. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem a week before he knew he would be going to the cross. And he's arrived for the Passover. The Passover was the central feast, the biggest celebration of the Jewish faith. It was and is as significant for Jewish people as Christmas is for Christians today. It celebrated the moment God brought them out of slavery into Egypt through the Red Sea and toward the promised land, the great exodus. It celebrated the moment that the angel of death passed over God's people, when significantly all those years before, they had painted crosses over the doors of their homes in the blood of a sacrificial lamb. And Jesus chooses this festival to be the moment he will be crucified, to make the point that he is our great high priest, He is the Lamb of God, our final sacrifice. He is the one who will lead those who follow him out of darkness and sin and spiritual slavery into light and full freedom of life. So, in coming to his death at the time of Passover, Jesus was making a clear statement, giving everyone a sign that he would be a great high priest, the willing sacrifice of God. who can be the one to connect us with our maker. But Jesus also arrived at the Passover festival with all the symbols and signs of another festival. And can any theologically astute people guess what that other Jewish festival might be? No one? Well, he arrives with all the symbols and all the signs of Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a different festival from the Passover. Of course, it's it's a celebrated a, a, a festival celebrated by the Jews in winter time, and in that period, it looked back to about 300 years before, when a man named Judas Maccabeus had got together an army of Israelites and led it out against invaders who had swarmed into Israel and defeated them. He then came back to Jerusalem 
and rode into the city in great celebration. And people had waved palm leaves before him and put their cloaks on the ground and had shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our father David. And Judas Maccabeus came and rededicated the temple and was crowned as a conquering king, a powerful political hero. Every year, the Jews would celebrate Hanukkah when God brought them this great political king. And so, on Palm Sunday, Jesus was taking the signs and symbols of Passover and the signs and symbols of Hanukkah, and he collides them together. And in doing so, he's making a point that would really have gotten people's attention. He's saying, yes, I am your priest, I'm your perfect sacrifice, I'm your savior, I am your friend, but I'm also your king. Your king, yes, I've come as your priest to deal with a, your past, but I've also come as a king to lead you into your future, your future. We live in a society today where there are plenty of people who love the idea of Jesus being their savior, but who aren't so in love with him being a king for us or in surrendering control of their lives to him, or maybe just one or two little parts of their life to him. There might even be some people in this room right now who are getting nervous at the very words that I'm speaking about that. But let me tell you what kind of king Jesus' entry into Jerusalem with all its signs and symbols shows us that he wants to be for us. Firstly, he's saying that he is a confrontational king. He's confrontational. Up until this point, Whenever Jesus has been doing, or wherever he's been doing ministry, or just about anything interesting, anything miraculous, anything that will make people really excited, he then goes to those same people and says, shh, don't tell anyone. Theologians call it the, the messianic secret. So he performs some amazing miracle, but then he'll say, go home. Don't tell anyone. Just go home and, and carry on living your life. Isn't that interesting? As a young Christian, I found that so, so confusing. And the reason is that these miracles aren't just good miracles for those people at that time to help them. They are also signs and wonders that point to the coming kingdom of God. Each one of Jesus' miracles shows that this world, which is not as it should be, is also under his final authority. He is the true king. And if he is the true king of all kings, then others are not. With each miracle, with each sign and wonder, he puts more and more pressure on the leaders and authorities to either put Jesus in jail or to put him to death, as they had done with John the Baptist. But Jesus isn't ready for that yet. It's not the right time yet. He still has things to teach and things to do. So he tells people, shh. But then he comes to Jerusalem. He comes to the place that is the center of all the political power, all the authority. And this is where you and I might have found it quite easy to be bold on the outskirts of the city. But when when you come to the capital, you'd be tempted to play things down a little bit, maybe arrive by the side door. But he doesn't do that. He comes in with a parade. He comes in with a festival. He whips the crowd up, shouting and calling to them, making a commotion. He's doing this to finally bring an ultimatum to the people of Jerusalem, those who admired him and those who opposed him. He's saying, either crown me or kill me. But you can't have anything else. Jesus is the most humble person in the world, but he's not modest. He's the least modest person who ever existed. He's very clear about who he is. He's truly humble. He came to a stable when he was born and not to a palace. He spent his time with the last, the least, and the lost, with those on the edge of society, as he calls us to do today. But he was never modest. He said things like, I am the creator of the heavens and the earth. He said that he will judge us when we die, no matter who someone is or what they believe. You know, those are not 
modest statement. If I started saying that to my wife, I'd be sectioned within minutes. <laughs> she has contacts in the NHS. And Jesus comes on Palm Sunday in absolute humility, but with no modesty. And he's sing he is signaling to everyone, essentially saying, you can crown me or, or you can kill me, but you can't just like me and walk away. In coming to Jerusalem with the symbols of a priest and the symbols of a king, Jesus is saying, you can't separate me. You can't say, welcome priest, welcome savior, but stay away king. Welcome friend and helper, but stay away Lord. You can't have half of Jesus, just the savior of your soul, but not the Lord of your life. He comes as a confrontational king and says, you need to choose. We need to choose today, as much as the inhabitants of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And so he's a confrontational king. But Jesus is also a king who turns our ideas of kingship and power upside down. He's a counterintuitive king. He's always turning our ideas and people's ways of wanting to look at him upside down. And how do we see this? Well, he's a king who arrives in Jerusalem on a donkey. Up until this point in the Gospels, Jesus' disciples had been kind of egging him on, pushing him forward, trying to get him into action, trying to get Jesus into starting a, a great political revolution for the people of Israel. And the whole time, Jesus is holding them back, saying, whoa, whoa, slow down. And he rebukes them. And he's saying, look, my plans are not your plans. And then they get to Jerusalem. And suddenly it's like Jesus is saying, all right, everyone, we're going to ride in now. And the disciples are all hyped up, thinking, yeah, finally, this is the moment. This is the moment we go in and, and get to be famous, and we get to see everything we've been expecting and everything we've been hoping for. And Jesus says, right, two of you, go ahead and get my ride. And it's a donkey. <laughs> it's a donkey. And, and, oh, they would have been so disappointed. A donkey is not very good or spectacular for traveling on. I don't know how many of you have ever tried traveling on a donkey, but Jesus' feet would have probably been dragging on the ground as he was pulled along. His head might have been beneath the crowds around him. They would have had a hard time seeing him. I mean, can you imagine Braveheart in the film doing that great war cry of a speech in the movie with blue paint all over his face? Freedom! And a sword thrust into the air, but riding on top of a donkey. Or, or Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump celebrating election victories by riding onto a stage on top of a Shetland pony. Well, what is Jesus saying? Well, he's mocking their power play. He's mocking their, their conqueror rituals. He's parodying the kind of victory parade that everyone else would have known about and even seen. This is an example of Jesus' sense of humor. If you know where to look, you can find plenty of examples in the Bible of Jesus using humor with the people around him. And here he's performing a, a sophisticated parody. When an ancient king invaded and conquered a nation, he would ride into the capital city high up on a stallion with shouting and banners and palm trees being waved. A victory in war was a big moment. And Jesus is saying, I'm coming to give you a victory, but I'm mocking the kind of victories you are used to. I'm mocking all other ways of being saved. He comes in on a donkey. Jesus is saying he's not coming in strength to kill, but in human weakness to die for us. And that is good news for us today, because it means that ordinary people like you and me can come to Jesus in our own weaknesses, which are many and simply follow him. Jesus could have said, I've done great things, I've taught wonderful lessons, I've broken taboos and refuted people who disagreed with me with razor-sharp wit and precision, and now you all do the same, and then you will be saved. But that would have been a message of salvation by strength for the strong, which would exclude all of us. Jesus comes in human weakness, which means that you and I can follow him. He comes in weakness not to kill, 
but to die, to die on a cross, not enthroned in a great palace, but on a cross in the dumping grounds outside the city. The crowds came to Jesus shouting, Hosanna, which means God save us, or more specifically, save us now, because they thought they needed political salvation, violent liberation from the Roman army. But Jesus is pointing them to the truth that actually our greatest need is reconciliation with our Father in heaven. And today our own minds are often preoccupied with wondering where we can find our security and political salvation, especially in this time of of really polemicized, deeply divisive politics all over the world, particularly in the West. For some, it's a desire for salvation from austerity. For others, salvation from socialism, salvation from Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin. I've known a number of Christians who've become so obsessed with their politics that they've ended up, without realizing it sometimes, putting it over and above their own Christian faith. Back in Aberporth, I knew, and I won't name any names, but I knew a a militant vegan who would send me letters and drop vegan leaflets into our church to falsely try and persuade people that Jesus had been a vegan, and Jesus wants everyone today to be vegans. One day, he told me I should put him in the pulpit of my church on a Sunday and tell, so that he could tell everyone about veganism. When I told him that he wasn't licensed by the Anglican church, sorry, nice little doorstop rule there, uh, he, he reminded me, he reminded me that Billy Graham hadn't been either, but was still invited to speak in cathedrals back in the day. And then I reminded him that he wasn't Billy Graham. Uh, <laughs> It's, I've, been, I've been yelled at and shouted at by people from one church who told me I wasn't a real Christian because I didn't support their view in the Israel-Palestine conflict. And I've heard bishops telling their churches that the most important thing for Christians to do today is talk about the environment, not Jesus. And another who spent every day of their ministry sending on average 120 tweets on Twitter viciously attacking a political party they disagreed with and and everyone who supported them, including retweeting content with endless swear words instead of just talking about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that I've never fallen into that way of thinking myself sometimes. I have sometimes. And I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't be involved with politics. But when it takes over your mentality to the point of obvious hatred and distraction from sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, that's when your politics have become a false idol and it has no place in this or any other church. That's when we become like the people shouting Hosanna and then a week later shouting crucify him. Jesus comes to say, whatever your politics might be, you have no idea how much more importantly, you need me. And how importantly you need the security and relationship with God the Father that he offers each of us today. That is wildly more important. He is the cause that can bring real salvation. He is the one we need to be talking about more than anything. He comes as our priest and as our king. Now, if you're anything like me, when you reflect on Jesus being your priest, your, your, your savior, your friend, you will be filled with thankfulness at what he's done with us. When you really reflect on it, really think about it, really wait on that and, and just, just reflect and reflect, you'll be full of thankfulness. But the, draw, the closer you draw to Jesus as your priest, the more you might start noticing that there are little areas of your life where he isn't quite your king yet where you might be rebelling against him a little bit. And the more experienced you are as a Christian and the more spiritually mature you are, the more you'll start finding those little areas. And the more, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he will reassure you, but also point out the little places in your life where there's still a bit of rebellion from Jesus' kingship, still a little bit of darkness all the time. And my advice to any mature Christian who's wrestling with this is just to be like the terminator. Exterminate any areas of, those, of that sin. Find the areas in your life today where you might need to repent. It could be something deep 
in your heart that God is slowly speaking to you about over a long time. My wife and I are really into marriage courses and helping couples with marriage preparation. And a picture of marriage that we see in the Song of Songs in the Bible is that of a beautiful vineyard, but one where foxes sometimes are creeping in to try and spoil things. And so in our marriage, my wife and I like to try and catch the foxes. We try and find little areas and talk about them openly where there are things just spoiling our relationship a little bit. But that in the Song of Songs isn't just a picture of a marriage. It's also a picture of our relationship with God. It should be a beautiful vineyard, but little foxes come in once in a while. And I'm always finding that the closer I get to God, the more he challenges me on those, on those foxes. So I encourage you to be a Christian who has a spiritual life where you're, you're constantly looking for those and asking God to show you where they are. Firstly, by by just reading the Bible, getting to know your scripture, where he teaches us what's right and wrong, or by praying and asking the Holy Spirit just to gently show us any areas of rebellion in our hearts today. God might even be doing that right now. In fact, I reckon he is for anyone who's really listening. That's a great and wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit, not to condemn us, but to confront us gently and lovingly to put the things on our hearts where he wants us to walk away so we can have freedom in our minds and be better people to love those around us. And I don't know about you, my favorite way of finding the foxes in my own relationship with God, of finding the areas of rebellion in my own life with him, is by looking at how I'm judging other people. I have issues with quietly in the back of my head judging other people. Oh, I don't know how much I should admit to that, but it's true. I struggle with it sometimes. And, but sometimes I'll find, oh, I'm really angry with this person or that person because of something they're doing, and it's playing on my mind again and again. Perhaps they're being selfish. Perhaps they're being cliquey or unloving or, or, or aggressive or something like that. And then I'll stop and ask God, hold on a minute. I'm exactly the same, aren't I? I'm the same so often when I find problems with other people. You know, when you get caught up in judging others, I'm sure you must feel the same. You must know that experience. Well, very often that's God gently showing us something that we need to work on ourselves. When I've ever been angry about other people's impatience or brutishness or, or unloving behavior, I've been able to look back and say, oh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> I'm not much better myself. But that's a springboard to change and to invite Jesus into our lives, to push away the rebellion and let him become our king again. I encourage you this morning, no matter where you are in your relationship with God, whether you're a mature Christian or if you're not sure what you believe at all and you're here maybe just for the first time, I encourage you, don't just let Jesus be your savior. Be excited to let him take his place as your king. Surrender yourself to him again today. Root out those dark areas in your life. Let them go and let him be the boss and put him in charge. Because the wonderful truth we come to realize as children of God is that the more we surrender control into Jesus' arms, the more freedom we experience. Amen. 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 Thanks, Chris. Let's uh, stand and sing our, our last song together. Jesus is the name we honor.
refreshments and if you'd like to pray with someone there'll be folks at the back in that corner uh, to pray with. Now, will you pray with me? Now may Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep our great high priest and king over all kings may Jesus equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him identifying the foxes and being Lord in every area of your life. To the glory of God, now and always. Amen. <laughs>